of a journey about what I went through and apparently there's still a problem. Okay, so try two. This talk is kind of going to be more about kind of a journey about uh, what I went through working for HP, basically, and the different kind of CI systems we tried out and uh, failed to make work. And eventually, we arrived probably in the last 12 months when I was still working for the cloud services team at a CI system that not only worked, was an improvement on what would be traditionally called CI. So, so I've worked in HP um, since uh, you know, 2005. Most of that time has been in release, build, and deploy type area. And I worked on more than one project. And I don't know if anybody will actually recognize any of those names. The SFS one was actually in the HPC field. It was a highly performant file system. Um, basically, the main problem for HPC systems was how do they get uh, several hundred gigs of data off onto somewhere that's actually going to store them uh, fast enough. Um, based on a file system called Luster, which is a parallel object file system, and I think it's still going if you have any interest in finding out about it. It's mostly been obsoleted by the move to parallel NFS. EXDS was an extreme data storage, um, kind of a continuation of what we were doing, but we moved kind of <coughs> into the enterprise area more than uh, and away from the HPC area, mostly because HP decided that they didn't want to be in the HPC area and we needed something else to do. The CMP project was basically a Java-based REST platform intended to remove loads of people working on the same management tools of a basic system control across the entire storage works. And um, sorry, skipped ahead there. KDS was a basic key value store. If you don't know what a key value store is, it's basically you put something in there, you get a hash out. When you put the hash in, it'll throw you back out what you gave it originally. However, it's massively distributed is the main goal of these. So in some cases, what you put there and what you get back may be out of date. But the idea was that if you're dealing with cloud stuff, you can handle that. You should know how to handle it. And the final one and the most recent one was with uh, cloud services and automation, which I think when I left was a division of about 300 engineers. And for the most time on it, we had three people trying to automate stuff for that entire division. Um, didn't work out quite so nicely, as you can imagine. I'm currently working for a company here now called Objective. Uh, so we'll see how that goes over the next few months. And Simple question about this talk, what would I know about CI? Well, I've kind of worked on a few um, really terrible ones, and I've been responsible for at least uh, two of those as well. Um, so, as I said at the start, what this talk will be about, my journey towards a better CI system, and away from the idea of build once a week Um, some of this is going to be looking at kind of the past mistakes, given um, kind of a retrospective look at uh, based on how things have gone well recently, and understanding how things could have gone. Hopefully, so you guys get a chance of uh, not repeating my mistakes if you ever happen to be working in this area. I'm going to see how things have improved, and also looking at how we arrived at what's called continuous integration by most textbook definitions, and then how we actually went and did one better than it, with some help from the OpenStack people, of course. So rather than starting my journey, I'm going to actually explain what we call CI and what's meant by continuous integration. This is the textbook definition. Um, it's uh, done, written by uh, Martin Fowler. 
He's uh, part of the Agile Alliance and is was partly responsible for the manifesto for Agile software development. Um, by the end of it, would have managed just about all of them. But the one thing I would say is that what we call CI, the last two would kind of these days be more called uh, continuous deployment rather than CI. I think it's just people realize that there's so much actual work in there, it's more important to actually uh, treat them as separate because there are an extension that tends to happen after your main CI. The simple picture. <clears throat> this is what everybody talks about when they're saying like uh, doing CI. Developers commit code uh, up to the source repository. Your CI server checks that out, builds and tests it, and then sends a report back. Um, that's the basic idea. So I'm going to start with the first build system I ever worked on. And it was a wonderful monolithic build that, uh, you know, 90 builds were apparently the way to And the reason they thought that is because before they had 90 builds, they had one guy that could build it once a week on just his machine and nowhere else. And uh, we're not talking about a small project. This was actually the SFS project. Um, this is not a good thing to do. Don't do it ever. Uh, it makes it really easy for management to kind of say, well, you know, it's not that big a problem that these things keep breaking. Um, nobody wanted to change, mostly because it's difficult to persuade people to change unless you've got something really convincing. Um, and except me, because uh, I was stuck working on this stuff and I hated it. Um, it was interesting that the other two people that had worked on the system were the only other two people out of about 20 developers that agreed it should be completely rewritten, mostly because if I was sick or on holidays, they got the task. And uh, if that's only like four weeks in a year, you can kind of realize it must have been pretty horrible for them not to want to touch it. <coughs> um, a couple of times, um, working late at night, I really wanted to uh, wreak revenge on the people responsible for causing me to have to stay until 11 and 12 o'clock at night. The sentiments on the site there, um, they're pretty accurate, they're well worth the read, and uh, I definitely thought about sending stuff like emails and calling people when there was the build was finally working, just to let them share the pain you know, of being woken up. So what were we actually using? Um, we had about 10,000 lines of shell code. If you ever use Bash, you know that's pretty horrific. That's not where it stopped. We had 10,000 lines of make files as well. And they were all written differently. There was no uniform interface to anything. So it was pretty much like one large script called another large script with very unusual arguments, which called another three or four scripts. Finally, the second script would eventually call some make files before handing back to the first one to actually call the remaining ones to build an ISO. Um, mainly, the main reason for it ended up like that is uh, it organically grew out of control. Um, same as everything. But um, this just meant that there was a few quirks as well about the build system. Um, one of them was that you couldn't actually build a file system against a kernel develop package. Uh, it was a very odd thing. They actually required a built tree because some of the files from a kernel build um, were not stored in the kernel develop packages by, Re by Red Hat at the time. So the consequence was that you could not build against any um, stock kernel. Even if you built the kernel and installed the packages, you couldn't build against it you had to have the original build tree that, uh, that the package was actually produced from. So That's generic. Um, we were patching it, but it didn't matter. There was just a number of files, um, I think it was to do with modifying some of the symbols that it actually needed to know some of the internal symbols in order to hook into the kernel properly. 
and they weren't being made available in the, uh, the produced packages at the time. This was Red Hat Advanced Server 2.1. Um, you know, this isn't recent. This is a long time ago. Um, but I'm pretty certain they've fixed it by now. Bill system, Chrome-based nightly bills, and an email notification. And that consequently meant that everybody ensured the email went to their junk folder each and every single time. We actually ended up with about 75 bills running in the end. Um, these were 10 server bills that would take four hours each and 65 different client bills because we needed to support RHEL 3, RHEL 4, SLES 9, SLES 9.1, SLES 9.2, SLES 9.3, OpenSUSE. Literally, our customers would take a version of Linux and not move off it for years. So by the end, we had a huge matrix of uh, things to, to test. Thankfully, most of the client bills were actually just about 45 minutes to an hour, but still beefy enough. <coughs> so um, our build was pretty much all or nothing. It was pretty much impossible once it broke to actually build anything subsequently with it. Uh, fixing usually involved a check-in, and you had to move a couple of tags after checking it in in order for it to ensure that it tagged the right thing when it's finished. So didn't happen. Once we got a fix working, it was basically restarted and wait four hours, mostly because we were using CVS, and it was pretty horrible to work with. And let's see. Yeah, like I said, it took four hours for a build to finish. That did get reduced, um, but you can imagine if you've got four-hour bills, they're horrible. And uh, I really got upset when somebody broke a build. So that tended to be me getting going down to somebody's cubicle once I worked out who it was they're responsible and uh, telling them, fix this now. What year was this? This was between 2005 and 2008. And we weren't building on poor hardware. Back then, we still had 32 core systems available to us. Um, you know, we were dealing with high performance systems. We had some beefy hardware to stick behind us. Un unparalleled, but, you know, just could not make that build parallel. When you say build, you mean the final result. They said this is what we were, what was actually being built, <coughs> because th there's a lot of stuff. So we were having to rebuild the kernel. We had file system patches, we had network patches, and then we had a bundle of our own custom patches on top of it. Most of the file system patches were around the EXT3, and I believe about 90% of those are now part of the standard kernel, and they make up part of the EXT4 file system. Stuff like uh, multiple block allocation and delayed allocation, which uh, massively speed up file system performance. And there was also a TCP zero copy because Ethernet performance on Linux at the time was truly horrendous because it copied so much data around. So it actually ner took nearly three times the amount of CPU processing power to actually just handle all of that as when you dumped in the uh, zero copy patch. You, you could actually handle multiple giggy um, network connections on the same system. Without it, you couldn't. It was that simple. And a couple of the custom patches, besides some weird fixes in the kernel for our hardware, one of them at least it just included a virtual console interface to uh, generate crash dumps on a key input. So uh, if you ever come across this, there's an ILO interface on most of HP's hardware, which was Compaq's at the time, or they had taken it from Compaq. The virtual and serial ports um, the actual keystrokes they can actually accept are limited. So if you want to send the sysrec information, you actually need to modify the kernel or tell sysrec to accept a totally different uh, type of um, input in order to generate it. Um, <coughs> we also had at least four different interconnects. We had a Quadrix network one. We had uh, QLogic, which is fiber channel. IB, which was actually Mellanox InfiniBand, and these days there's pretty much only InfiniBand and 10 gig E are left in that area. And the main reason for these really odd interconnects was latency. It could take 
um, about 50 times the length of time to send the same packet, same series of packets on an Ethernet uh, connection as it would on a Quadrix. Not because of the huge data size, but because Ethernet couldn't do on the wire communication. That is, once a series of packets are actually on the wire, it couldn't actually start the next seri series of packets whereas Quadrix could, and it had enough intelligence in the hardware to retransmit those two on the physical layer. So. Okay, so also we had the file system we needed to build, and a couple of storage array drivers, just because we happened to be using stuff that wasn't, uh, didn't work with the kernel. Multiple user space management packages that simplified working with Luster because it was terrible if you were using the official one. And we had Anaconda with custom patches, and you may kind of go like, why the hell were we patching it? Back then, it didn't work properly. Um, you could not specify a kickstart file that was in an ISO image. Uh, so we had to patch for that. And we also had to patch away most of the dialogues because we wanted to drop an ISO into the system in a CD drive, plug it in, and walk away. Um, and you couldn't do that by default. So our final thing was an installed ISO. Um, <coughs> what did we actually improve? Well, uh, kind of the build environments. Um, we've discovered that at least some of the packages would modify the environment when they were built. Um, that was because Anaconda had to be built by root because of an EXT2 image it generated. So you couldn't build it as a user. So that meant the entire build system actually, just for simplicity, was done by root. InfiniBand also required to be built by root because it modified the system, which was great because you couldn't build it on, on a system once and then actually build it a second time. It would fail. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It, it, the, the build of it was that wrong and that broken. Two builds in succession on the same system broke. Yes. So you can understand why I didn't want to do that. So we had a, you know, we just had a Chirush, um image of about 200 megs just blast down into a directory on the system each time, and it just simply built within that area. Um, we eventually got rid of our email stuff um, with a nice status page from BuildBot. Uh, that's a Python-based um, CI tool using Twisted and Zoap. I think it's pretty much everybody's ignoring it now because of Jenkins is so much better. And we actually got the build times down to two and a half hours, mostly due to a tool called Ccache. Um, you can build a kernel in five minutes if you're using Ccache correctly. Uh, if you're not, it'll take like you know around close to an hour for what we were building. Well, it was, it, was, it was still important like that where you reduce the time. You know, that was my time. You know, so if I was sitting there for four hours waiting for a build to finish, I'm much happier if I'm only sitting there for two and a half hours. <laughs> but if you really would use VMware, it would be on the level of the modules. If we could make it do that. Yeah, yeah. I, <clears throat> I would have loved to persuade the people I was working with that that would have been a good idea. Because I hated the idea of rebuilding the kernel every time, unless we had a patch change, which is all I thought that we should uh, do it on. I didn't get to make certain decisions. Um, if I was looking back now and I had to make the same decision, I'd be telling them, I don't care. So we still had two and a half hour build times. Um, I think that was the main problem there listed. Um, they wanted the same version of coming out of every single package. That is insane. Um, there is one team with mostly the same people inside HP cloud services these days. Their thing building takes an hour because they're applying the exact same idea to it. They want the same version on every single package. So they're rebuilding at least 15 or 16 kernel module packages and many, many other software packages just to get that even. Um, how do you mean authenticity? Well, 
this was HPC, you know, they didn't care about that. You know, our customers are actually pretty technical, so they were quite happy if stuff um, just about worked. Um, basically, the, the developers want to be able to run new name on Azure, and if the version was different on the kernel or any other component that we built, they wanted to know that somebody installed something different. Um, I would have said that's what a script and a manifest file is for. <laughs> that should have been good enough. Um, and also, they were using the date, just the date in the version, or rather an encoded date in the version, and I assume some people can spot the slight problem there. Two bills on the same date had the same version <laughs> and would overwrite one another. So you wouldn't be able to distinguish them. That's also why it was difficult to build more than nightly. Um, I couldn't give a good enough reason to completely overhaul and fix it. Um, if you ever find yourself in that situation, <coughs> don't work to like midnight trying to fix stuff. Spend, spend some time tracking where your time is spent. Um, that's actually been the number one problem I've seen across CI for the last, you know, that area for the last uh, eight years. Um, if you can't show figures and numbers, everybody will just ignore because it's not them who have to deal with the 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 fallout. Um, so, uh, as I said, builds can only be nightly. Didn't work any other way. Um, there were significant delays in turning any fixes around. Um, best case scenario to get a fix to QA for any problem whatsoever was at least one day. More commonly, it was more like a week, and releases were six to 12 months apart. <laughs> So, you know, um, there was a significant amount of time spent just copying, lost the screen there, copying data around, um, at least one hour just moving data around because of the way scripts were written. They expect this stuff to be in certain directories, and you ended up copying a whole lot around. Um, at least one gig of data was being archived every night for each build. So that's about a 650 meg image. And there was a couple of hundred megs around the kernel and all the kernel modules to preserve the build route of every single one of them, just in case we needed to rebuild Luster against that version <laughs> ever again. Um, it could have been parallel, it made parallel, um, absolutely. Uh, I just wasn't uh, given enough time. Um, <clears throat> so overall, what kind of impact that this kind of system had? We had about a 70% build success rate. Uh, and that was a guesstimate on my part because it's, you know, it's at least six years ago that I last looked at some of the numbers from this. That may sound reasonably good. It's still a 30% failure rate. Um, that's one and a half failures per week on average, and that's at least six hours gone per week in delays, um, just waiting for another build to be finished. Um, not everyone is going to be delayed what you consider if you have two people on your QA team and on average maybe 25% of your devs impact, it mounts up pretty quickly. And it's, uh, I think I calculated it was about eight weeks for multiple people. More than one pe person will be impacted by that per year. Um, so difficult build system to test. It took about two hours to fix any problem with it. Didn't matter. No matter how trivial it was, it took at least two hours. If you assume you're only productive 25 hours a week, the build person was the first person that triaged every single problem. Um, so it was me fixing pretty much everything, unless I could prove it was somebody else. I did some sums recently, and I worked out that cost four and a half hours a week. Just, just me. Um, and over a year, it worked out at close to somewhere between nine and 10 weeks that I was completely unproductive. Um, that's assuming at 25 hour hours you're going to get of productive work a week. Um, if I'd had those figures at the time, and if I'd spent the time to actually create those, I probably would have got an awful lot more traction in, in making changes. So I cannot, you know, 
emphasize doing that enough. I mean, that's really simple maths, just to sit down and just do it out. I didn't do it at the time. It'll save you a lot of pain if you ever have to work this out. And even with the, the reduced build times at the end, it was still working out at seven hours, seven weeks um, at the numbers right here. If somebody wants to look at them and check my maths. I think we can obviously say that's not CI. <coughs> Lessons learned. Simple. Um, avoid triaging everything. If you've got one person triaging all your problems, you're going to lose a lot of that person's time. Um, it's really important to make sure that the people who committed last, since the last successful build, are notified that it's their problem to fix it or investigate it. Um, Avoid multiple different build technologies in the same um, kind of project. Um, either split up to separate projects and, and kind of put a standard interface, um, or do something else. Just strip it out and rewrite it. There was a couple of missed opportunities during this. Um, said should attract the time better. Uh, important to have figures on time lost. And any build that takes over 30 minutes is just insane. Yeah. So out with the old, in with the new, moved on to something that we had a chance to wipe the slate clean and try something completely new. Um, and this was called EXDS. As I said, that was a kind of a large storage solution aimed at the enterprise. It used a cluster file system based on a company called PolyServe, which were acquired by HP and I think essentially don't exist anymore. Read what you will into that. Essentially, we moved from the HPC space to enterprise, and it was still mostly the same team, so we still had mostly the same problems. No. I'm going to say straight up no. Couldn't do, we didn't do better. Um, we had the same kind of insane uh, focus on having the same version of everything. Um, so that meant we have to rebuild any time any change occurred anywhere, even though we were producing probably between 25 to 30 separate packages that could have been done individually. And the only good thing I could say about that project was that we switched to, to Subversion. So it at least it simplified the bill somehow. But that's probably the only good thing I could say about subversion. So what were we building this time? We still had a kernel which we were modifying. This time at least it was rel five, so we only had about five patches that were actually applying to it. Um, we still had storage array drivers, so got rid of all the interconnects. Now we're back to standard Ethernet, no, nothing exotic. This is the enterprise space. Nobody is going to pay 20 grand for a single network card. So <laughs> stuff like Quadrix just went out the window. OK. And we had multiple user space management tools. And we still had Anaconda with some custom patches, because there were still a few problems with Anaconda in there. Hmm. Yes. So. We moved to DVD at this stage, RHEL 5. Lots more packages we needed um, to be able to install more. And we still wanted to like walk up to machines, stick it in, and walk away, and have it boot up, install, and be able to connect remotely to it without any problems. So looking at improving the software this time, I wanted a rule-based system to basically manage cross uh, component dependencies. And I looked on at multiple tools, SCONS, uh, ANT, Maven, there was a few others. There was a there was a Perl based one, and I settled on um, this to my uh, to my major regret. <laughs> so the reason I picked that is that there was another team in Galway where I was working, and they had worked non recursive type make, um, and their builds were quite performant and quite flexible, and I was very impressed. Partly because I read this paper about recursive make being considered harmful. To be honest, trying to use it was probably more harmful to me than anything else. Um, 
Did they? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Make is good in the space that it's supposed to work in. What I try to use it for, it doesn't work. Um, keep it within a project building in individual files. Trying to go to like the next level up where you're managing which projects you should build and what files are actually being produced from them. Is It would seem like Make can do it well, but when you're producing stuff like RPMs where the version of them change depending on what in the spec file, writing rules around that to ensure that you actually got the right output is surprisingly difficult to confirm it. Um, <coughs> but the idea was this that basically you could start the build from any point and it would actually try and redo, we would work out what it had done before and skip over them and just continue on. Goal was to reduce the time spent from fixing each time from two hours to less than three quarters of an hour. Um, that still equates to two hours a week lost on average given uh, the 70% success rate. So, uh, there we go. Um, and that still works out at over four weeks a year. So it's still not particularly good. I said it seems reasonable. Um, didn't work out that way. What worked? The idea worked in general. Um, Unfortunately, it was sufficiently complex that no one else was willing to touch. And that was the major problem with this system. It was too difficult for anyone else to actually pick it up and run with it. It required too much knowledge across everything to understand where information was being gathered from in order to make stuff. It wasn't just the file that they were working with initially. There could have been a config file about uh, you know three levels in a different area that was actually being pulled in because it was using a non-recursive include every make file there is to understand what to build. Um, <coughs> yes, we did kind of manage to fix one problem, or at least I did. Um, managed to work out who the previous committers were since the last successful build, and every time it failed, it emailed them, not me. So. Uh, I got away from triaging everybody else's screw up, basically. Um, also, went heavily with BuildBot CI, which was picked over Jenkins, um, mainly because it was Python and it was really easy to configure dynamically from SVN. Um, so, essentially, the configuration code for it could be pulled out from SVN and it could automatically generate all the objects I needed and then produce. At that stage, I don't think Jenkins had anything equivalent to that. Um, one of the things is that we did improve on is that all built environments could pretty much be recreated at any time. Um, but we moved away from this custom hackery of a Sharoot script written by me to use something called OpenVZ containers. Um, and this was partly easier because we were no longer building the likes of Mellanox uh, InfiniBand. So that's essentially what our CI tool looked like. Um, you could click on any one of those uh, links across the top, the, in the one circled in red, and that would take you through to a page where you could then trigger a build manually if you needed one straight away. Builds took about two and a half hours at night, and this project we actually required, were required by HP to code sign everything which actually meant transmitting all the packages over the network to a server somewhere in Fort Collins in the US, and then having it sign them for us using a particular key and send them back. And it uh, didn't add a lot of time to the build at all, just about six hours. <coughs> Sorry, that was the, yeah, verify. Yeah, the HPC people didn't mind as much. Um, Usually their systems were behind so many different firewalls, they didn't care too much about the access. Was that on the other end? I have no idea what was on the other end. We had no. zero access to it. We, you know, the best we could do is say, um, basically create a particular LDAP group and say, please allow this uh, files from this LDAP group to be transmitted to you in a certain file format and you will sign them and send them back to us. And that's it. That's all we knew about that system.
Yeah. Yeah, in, in reality, it was probably overkill and completely unnecessary. So a couple of lessons learned from this. Uh, monolithic builds still sucked. Um, make works well as winning projects, but not in the way I was using it. Um, yeah, I can't say that strongly enough. Don't use it for top-level project, inter-project dependency management. It just isn't designed for that. Um, at least we got the notification thing right, and the, but the problem was the build failures impacted too many people because I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where there's three people who've committed code and the build is broken. I'm sure you know that the person who calls the build to break is going to own up and say, yes, it was my fault. <coughs> and that pretty much never happened, so it still meant that somebody had to prove um, which code was wrong, or just simply revert the whole lot. And being able to recreate our build environments um, was very, very useful. It pretty much meant that experimentation could be done on anybody's system. Um, so all the developers could pull down some kind of uh, environment to match what's going to happen in the build environments. So you could test stuff theoretically to match the how the build environment was going to build it, um, but that didn't change it. Developers didn't use it, uh, surprisingly enough, unless you had something like we have today, which like is like Vagrant. Um, I think that's about the only way that you might persuade a developer to test a pre-created build environment. Um, and I, I perfectly understand that, because I would do the same. I am not sitting there for an hour pulling down an image just to see if it's going to work when I can commit it and see if the build breaks. So a couple of more missed opportunities. We still didn't split everything up. We still had that insane requirement. Um, and we still weren't building immediately when the change was committed. Um, that's a mistake. You queue up too many uh, changes, and people basically end up nuking the build for at least two to three days, because nobody who committed wants to admit that their code was wrong and therefore they don't want it reverted. So the only way you could either get out of it was revert everybody's code or hope somebody could work out which one was broken and fix it. Given that we seem to be halfway, should we take a break? Wow. Um, a quick 10 minute break? Yes. Okay. Didn't realize uh, Looks like my timing is going to be off on this, so it's going to take longer than expected. Get a drink, get a bit more of the cracker than cheese, and then we'll have the other half of the talk. I can't talk fast enough. With Fort Collins, you could have been sending your builds over. With Fort Collins, you could have been sending your builds over for a beer. That would have been a nice idea.
So the second half of the talk, if we if we've all grabbed a cracker with cheese on top. Okay, part two, please. Okay, so um, <coughs> hopefully I don't take as long for this part as I did for the first part. Um, apologies for not managing to strip out some of the, uh, the longer pieces that would have sped this up a little bit, but um, I pretty much finished writing this uh, today and I uh, haven't had a chance to go through and prune the slides, remove the croft and the unnecessary stuff. So got rid of the EXDS at some stage and we got moved on to a thing called Common Managed Platform. And uh, basically the idea of that was that we're starting with a brand new project and StorageWorks, a division within HP, wanted some kind of common platform that was REST based that every other team could use to configure systems with rather than having everybody write their own type of configuration and management tools to manage it. That comes like, you know, in those days network management and, you know, asking for a particular file system to be created was pretty much every, everybody just doing it by hand and uh, they were looking for something to uh, remove all of that act actual duplication of work. So yes, we'll consolidate all of that. Um, we moved to Java. Yes, actually someone asked me there, like, you know, what was the, uh, the other projects uh, mostly written in? It was a combination of C, which would have been all the kernel stuff, any of the drivers that worked with the kernel, and a couple of the management utilities that actually used um, sysallux to talk to the kernel directly also were written in C. But it was mainly Tickle then in the management space. So we eventually dumped all of that and moved to Java because we had to support Windows. <laughs> this was the first project we actually had to worry about that. Um, so. Yeah, maybe we don't have to use make this time. Maybe there's something else that might be a little bit better. So the approach for this project was rather than trying to do everything in one monolithic style, I finally won an argument and persuaded them to split everything up into separate projects. Part of this was because they wanted to actually li release different groups of projects for both Windows and Linux. So trying to put everything all in one would have just been painful. Um, I, we wanted to have use everything to use a REST interface. Um, so, and each project were, was effective. If they needed to talk to another project, they would use the REST protocol, um, the REST interface of that project themselves as well. Our layout was to basically treat everything as a separate project. And uh, some people might recognize that layout. That is the the second most common type of branching scheme in Subversion. Um, the other one is to put the trunk branches and tags at the top. Um, but this meant that we could get away, from the, get away from the idea of the monolithic version across everything because everything was going to be released, branched, tagged, and versioned independently. Success. Um, Developers also want to use Eclipse for their IDE and Apache Wink for REST. So that essentially, essentially informs some of the decisions about a build system, which was going to be Ant or Maven. Um, yeah, I, I didn't like Maven. Not because I don't think it's a good way of doing stuff, but any time you needed to step outside of the box, it was absolutely horrific. Um, it's not so bad these days. They've put a lot of work into adding lots of tasks and plugins around to do all the slightly unusual tasks. But um, for it, the time we were using it, it pre pretty much wasn't an option. It was going to spend, you're going to spend too long writing Java plugins in order to get Maven to work with some of the C projects and other cases where we needed to unpack RPMs and extract their libraries in order to build against them. Slightly odd. And I used Ivy for dependency management. And that was essentially, that solved the problem I had with the previous project in that I didn't have a good solution for cross-project dependencies. And Ivy is, uh, Ivy is a kind of a dependency manager that was added 
um, for Ant by the people who basically found that they wanted to use Ant, but wanted something that could do maybe dependency resolution. The big benefit was this, is that we still had some DLL and shared library projects, and Maven does not deal with those particularly well, whereas Ivy just says, just give me an identifier for that dependency, and I will manage to store it and find it. So it, it could work with any type of file. There was no um, predefined sets of types of dependencies or libraries as far as Ivy was concerned. So that meant you could have a document as a dependency if you really, really wanted. Um, don't know if anyone did that. But the other part was that it integrated really well with Eclipse through a um, plugin called IVDE, which is still going. And of course, Eclipse had native and support. That's a quick look at what we did. We essentially made every project have an identical layout to, at the base level, an identical interface. So they would all call um, the build XML file. Every developer knew where the files they had to work with were, no matter which project they were working on. That actually proved really helpful, because before they were very, very uh, wary of trying to find where the information was, because it was stored in so many different unusual locations for everything. This time, standard layout, and everything kind of was repeatable across all the projects, so they could find everything. Um, it would have been really cool if we worked out how to generate the version um, from build tags or from the tags we were storing in, in Subversion. A uh, short-term solution was just write a file and stick a version in there for the time being until we worked out how to do something smarter. I started using shortcuts. I said, it doesn't have to be perfect, just as long as it worked. Um, the MSI folder was actually where we were planning to store Wix files, which is XML files to build Windows installers. And conversely, the RPM one was to store spec files and any uh, scripts that were needed by the RPM. So um, build file builds of everything combined was less than 30 minutes. So that was brilliant. You know, no more two and a half hours. There was what, probably about 12 components in total. So, you know, that kind of gives you an idea that none of them exceeded five minutes individually. And that meant that we had a lot of room for those growing. That was the, the, the kind of thing that they'd forgotten about in the previous projects. Build times only get bigger. Um, they rarely go the other direction as you add more code. Um, yeah. They didn't write any tests on that. Um, but at least we would have been quick building even if they did have tests. And unfortunately, the, the overall build was still slightly monolithic, mainly because I didn't have enough time to teach BuildBot how to parse IV manifest XML files. Um, these days, that would be trivial. You just use Jenkins. It has an IV plugin. Job done. Um, I don't know if any of the other tools actually do it now. Did you build any internal tools? What's the build name of the build? Uh, a build is basically you're going in and saying, build this. Um, <coughs> if you want to, if you're using Eclipse, you know, it's automatically compiling behind the scenes. In my case, it was building packages. Build all the source code, produce the binaries, mm, output a package at the end of it. Um, but that's essentially what it would, would produce. Obviously, it varied from project to project. A couple of them were using ISOs. In this case, the output of each project was going to be an RPM or an MSI. And yes, but at least all the bills were the, the bills themselves. Every time something was triggered, or sorry, every time something was committed, whatever project it was. Um, Yes, it would trigger a build of all the projects, which would produce RPMs for all of them, but at least they were triggered, um, which was an improvement. Everything had the same two commands that were executed on it. Um, generally, I only executed the, the scripts would only execute the second one, um, just and package was enough. Uh, but for debug and you know, for also to make sure it worked with Eclipse, if anybody needed to add a task to do it by hand. You needed the first one as well. 
Um, yep, I said same layout for everybody. And I've actually already said that. And yeah, because everything was the same, it made it really easy to add new projects and to move forward. Before on um, the previous two projects, adding something new actually took a bit of work. Um, but at least in this case, we were using, we were writing them all ourselves. We weren't having to work with somebody else's crappy build like uh, Mellanox. And the use of Ivy and Artifactory worked with native um, libraries. So that's the DLLs and shared object libraries. And builds were fast. So we're getting closer. Um, not fully automated. <coughs> there was a lot of duplicated code. Um, it didn't manage to produce a nice ant library to move away all the templating that was actually in the, the build XML files. But at the very least, you could copy one project to another space, rename it, and change you know, maybe five or 10 lines, and you had a new project um, just to start with. Developers were reluctant to kind of muck around with the Ant and the Ivy stuff, at least initially. And this was kind of my first experience where they were interested, but they were worried they were going to break something. Um, so they started mailing patches to me, which, okay, was an improvement over before. Um, but since everybody was building locally on their own machine using Eclipse, it actually meant they were always using the same build system and the, the same files that the, uh, the automated builds would actually use to try and produce packages. So at least they were slightly more interested. So I said, how did we kind of get to a proper CI system? Um, reminder of the steps. Uh, that's pretty much the summary of them. For the most part, uh, except, you know, it wasn't self-testing, but, you know, I couldn't write unit tests for all of their stuff. And it did, every commit was built, um, just not in the way I wanted. But it was fast. It was pretty easy for anyone to get the executables. And everybody got notified on stuff breaking, so they could see what was, what was happening. Given enough time, this project actually turned out to be really short. It got handed off. Uh, and our team very nearly got let go because Storage Works was being a bit weird. Um, so given another probably three months, we probably would have met all of those requirements. Um, the main reason for the time was for a team of 25 developers, they had one person working on this and supporting every single developer. Um, <coughs> that doesn't work. You, you, it just really kind of a one to 10 people ratio is more sensible. Otherwise, there's about an 80% support workload and 20% moving forward. It's, it's uh, anyone who knows like what the 80-20 rule means knows that's the wrong way around. So what happens? So we moved to cloud. We killed that other project, uh, handed it off to a uh, team in India, and um, walked away because Storage Works didn't want us. They found another division that did. And so that was 25 people in uh, one team simply moving divisions in uh, pretty much <coughs> one month. So doesn't, I don't think that ever really happens, you know, particularly where uh, the previous group weren't interested in losing all of you. So now we moved to a thing called the Key Value Store, or KVS, which came from HP Labs. And this was kind of the entry point into the cloud services story. This is similar to OpenStack Swift, and, but written in C++. It uh, uses Boost Bind a lot. Uh, it was actually quite impressive, particularly when we discovered that people were randomly rebooting about 30 to 50% of the nodes that were being tested by QA, and QA hadn't noticed. <laughs> so you know, for levels of redundancy and actually just staying working, it was like, pretty good. I don't think we had ever had any other project that we worked on that had that sort of level of um, capability and redundancy in it. So <coughs> what source code do we use? Monotone, pretty old version. Um, this was kind of the first project with decentralized source control we used. 
And any time you wanted to push code, essentially you ran all the build and all the unit tests. So it's pretty good. Um, problem was, code review was post-publish. Seems a bit odd to me because it meant that the mistakes were already there. Uh, what was good? We had to publish with a um, pass build with a full unit test suite. Uh, code review did still help, even if it was post review. We picked up a lot of problems. Um, what was worse? Multiple commits before the final result was good. Because all of our code review was afterwards, you ended up having a huge amount of noise introduced into what was actually in the repository. And people really only wanted to review the final result, but were forced by the system to, uh, to review every single commit. I should point out that I didn't actually write any of this. At this stage, I was experiencing the, uh, the joys of this system. Um, the benefit, there is a question all the minor mistakes. Um, I know there's a big arguments about whether you should see where someone was coming from in the source code, in the history of it, or whether it's more important just to see the final result. Um, it's, it's unoptimized versus people reviewing. It just takes too long if you have every mistake all the time. So, finally, um, what have I learned? People are reluctant to make changes uh, in areas they don't understand. This results in me being a single point of failure when I need to build teams any time that I was actually working on bills. Um, bills need to be fast, that's obvious. Uh, if necessary, split them up. Treat them as separate projects. Um, splitting up larger build systems introduces additional integration complications for CI. Uh, that's not always obvious. What happens is that people break other people's code in different components even though their unit tests pass. So project A commits change, their unit tests passed. However, project B depended on project A that is completely rewritten an interface they were using. It breaks. Um, yeah, pretty much everything. You need to use the same build interface. It takes too much effort to have a custom one. And it's too complex for even for most CI systems because you end up managing the CI system by hand. It's pointless. The reason I picked BuildBot over Jenkins at initially was because I could generate the build configuration from a config file and a script. And that was really fast. So what fundamental problem did we spot with general CI? Um, so if the build breaks, you know, the developer that committed the break, okay, he's blocked. But even if he gets fixed, in the meantime, somebody else could have committed broken code on top of that again and then block somebody else. So you end up with this kind of whack-a-mole situation as you try to get each person to fix what they broke. Um, that, that's... That's basically finding, the, the, the fundamental problem is finding out after the code has been published into your source code that it's broken is just too late. You need to know before then. So this is what we were aiming for so far. But uh, let's see if it pulled it. Yeah, I think the title on this is wrong there. Okay, so this layout blocks, sorry, no, this, this is right. Sorry, I missed. If you change the inter continuous integration position with the source repository and you essentially test every change before you apply it, um, you ensure that what's in your source code repository is correct and working all the time. So it's never broken. Um, this, if you do it the normal way, that is a pre-commit hook, it blocks developers until the change is accepted. That's what we experienced in KVS. Um, we wanted to publish code. It would take half an hour if it was broken. You'd have to stop, work out what was broken, see if it's your fault, and try again. Because um, occasionally some things did break. But it meant that you could go two hours before the change we're trying to commit is actually accepted. So <clears throat> if you can avoid the delay of accepting the changes, if you can have something that's like a review server or something that can hold the code and basically report to the developers 
code client or they're, if they're using subversion, just basically report straight away that there's an error or somehow tell it like, you know, it's okay. Um, with distributed source control, that's a lot easier because you don't have to break the subversion client to actually make that work. And essentially, rather than applying it to the actual repository, the review system holds it in an unapplied state, sends it off to the Jenkins or your, your CI server. It reports back on it as a normal reviewer. And if the change is good, it then lands in your source code repository. So this essentially removes the delay. The developer gets the immediate kind of notification. Your change has been at least accepted. You can go on. I'm not going to hold on to your terminal while we test this for half an hour. Um, so did I get? Yes. So that's the problem. That if you can have to, I actually think there's a there's a bug in my um, my slides that it's uh, showed the wrong thing there. Uh, this idea isn't new. Um, a lot of open source projects have used this idea of a patch submission type queue and checking every single uh, commit. Um, one project I tracked for years is called Wine. They do that as well. They check every change that's sent to a patch queue before their main uh, maintainer will even consider reviewing it and seeing whether it's actually sensible. So if the change goes red, he doesn't care. He's not going to look at it. Um, so this only reports kind of whether, in a lot of cases, the patches were good or bad if you use a patch submission queue. Um, it doesn't give, you any, doesn't give you any kind of social feedback. Somebody can't comment and actually see, you have, see the comment about it unless you like doing it through email. And um, that might work in some cases, but for most kind of team-based projects, that's too uh, clunky. So if you have an actual nice code review tool sitting in between a set of the mail queue that can display everything on a web interface, then at least all your developers can actually comment on it and everybody, including the CI tool, becomes a reviewer. So this is what we used in HB Cloud. Um, once we basically ditched the KVS tool and moved to using OpenStack Swift, we started inheriting some of their tooling and we also started adding to it. So they realized, as we did at some point, that if you've got many projects, it's not sensible to break um, any of the projects individually. And if you've got 30 or 40 developers, any time any of the code is broken, that's 30 or 40 developers that cannot work. They can't clone to use the latest code and know that it wasn't their code that they had locally that is breaking their, their tree at the moment. Um, I think the basic way that's using, working is that developers make the local changes, publish it to something that holds onto it. In this case, we were using Garrett. That notifies your CI uh, system, and we were using a Garrett trigger plugin in Jenkins. Um, that does its usual tests and reports back whether the change is good or not. If it's not, it just send, tells the developer we're you know, no good. If it's good, down to one minute. If it's good, it's then available for people to actually review and comment on it. Um, so if you're busy, you don't bother reviewing anything that hasn't actually been at least approved, unless someone says, I know this isn't ready, but I need to know if the design is actually even sensible. Um, once it's passed review, it then goes back into the the I tool to actually check is it still good because obviously this is asynchronous so there could have been three or four patches accepted between the time that the review the change was originally sent up and the reviews completed so failures of code on your trunk or master were massively reduced it reduced I think we hit a kind of like somewhere between a 95 and 98 percent success rate and there was there was some intermittent failures, slaves disappearing, IPs being used by other systems that shouldn't have been using them. But it was the, gene it was the general errors that would always break your system. Um, yeah, come build issues. Just a very simple math comparison to kind of show why this was so much better. If you ignore the common issues, you can actually create a, kind of a a math description of just how bad the limit 
of um, the impact was for a basic CI, just the process. The limit of impact is essentially the number of developers you have. The more developers you have, the more people that can be impacted. So x being your number of developers, as that goes to n, the function of the number of people impacted goes to n as well. The change in this case with the code review and pre-check CI combined basically sets that at 1. There's only one person that's impacted. You know, if you exclude the common issues, one person is impacted. That's the person who sent the code up. If their stuff wasn't good enough, they're the person that's having to wait. Uh, nobody else. And I think I just have two slides left. Um, <coughs> failures at the pre-check area, the pre and the gate area, actually increase. You know, so you can see a 50% failure in that area. It's unintuitive. You'd be kind of going like, well, what's happening there? Um, people are um, using the checks to actually validate their code rather than spending the time checking every combination and every test on their own system. So you just check the piece they were working on and then send it up to see if it worked. Uh, so they end up, the developers end up ma making use of the CI tools to verify their actual code. Um, that's an unexpected thing. I didn't expect to see that. Um, you know, if you're using Subversion and you've got no checks, you spend a lot more time making sure your code is actually correct before firing it um, up and breaking everybody else. Since you can't break everybody else, you might as well use the CI system to actually do what it does well. And essentially, it speeds up development. People spend less time checking every single test. You know, there's multiple versions of Python to test against PEP8 checks. You might run the PEP8 checks to check that it just works on your machine. You won't bother checking to see if it works for three different versions of Python or if it actually works when you can run with some other tools that you're not using. And um, <coughs> this was the other one ex unexpected thing. Developers became much, much more willing to work on projects they didn't understand because they could submit the change, kind of go like, is this good? It works for me, but you know, could you tell me if this is acceptable? Um, so that meant that rather than the build person or the expert having to own all the files that round the build and manage all those, you put them in the project and if the developers have a problem, they can have you submit a fix in, they can accept it and move on, or if they have a problem with some of your general tooling, they can try and submit a fix to you and move on themselves and you can work out whether or not their fix is actually good or not or it's going to break somewhere else. So this is the improvement. It's on that fifth line there. It should be every commit should be built and tested on an integration machine before inclusion. If you want to save lots and lots of time, save lots and lots of heartache, that will make your life so much better. And this might have been a really long-winded way of getting to that, but that's the essential message. Use code review and use CI combined. Okay. Any other questions? Quickly. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 